The Accidental Entrepreneur is brought to you through our affiliate relationships with the following sponsors. Digital Accelerant, the digital mobile business card that generates leads. Text the word LAW to 21000 to get connected and learn how to get your own digital business card. And by Fetch Internet and Fetch Pro, the secure high-speed app that eliminates the need to pay for hotspots or use public unsecure Wi-Fi. And Printify, the online on-demand print shop for all your corporate merchandise. Be sure to visit our online store and get your own podcast merch. Listen to all of our sponsors' commercials later in this episode and follow their links in the show notes to learn more about their products and services. We'll take $100,000 off that as your profit. Now you only got four hundred dollars to work with. Right. But then out of that, we're going to take out how much you're going to use to continue operating your company to figure out how much you're going to spend just on this project. And does that make sense? So yeah. not only is it the profit, but it's like, okay, yeah, we need to, we need, you know, to pay administrative costs, rent, right. all that this, kind of stuff. Yeah. The difference between cost of goods sold. Correct. And actual expenses of running the business, which is the big one that business owners they, miss. They miss. Yeah. 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 And it's amazing once they are, you know, they're like, Oh my God. And then, then they kind of like get hyper focused on it, and it, it's kind of fun after that point because they're like, "Well, we did this this budget for this particular project. Did you take out, you know, that we're going to do have you know postage or whatever?" <laughs> like, right. okay, yeah, but it's great because they realize, you know, oh, I really have control over this, and they can make the the ju- the call. Does this, you know, even if even it looks like a ton of money, but if it's going to cost you five hundred five thousand dollars to do this five hundred thousand dollar project, then don't do it. The information provided in these episodes is for entertainment purposes only. It is not a guarantee of success or to be construed as advice of any kind. You should always seek advice from local licensed professionals before making any decisions. The dictionary defines an entrepreneur as a person who organizes and manages any enterprise, especially a business, usually with considerable initiative and risk. People often start a business without much choice, perhaps due to a job loss or just being dissatisfied at work, and they come up with an idea they just know can be successful. They become entrepreneurs by accident. That is to say their success or failure happens by accident, not with intention. My name is Mitch Beinhacker. I'm a corporate attorney and a business advisor. You're listening to The Accidental Entrepreneur, my podcast about how to achieve success on purpose, not by accident. Join me along with our monthly guests where we share our knowledge and help you get a hold of your business. And now on to today's episode. Just to remind you, the podcast is produced and brought to you by my legal practice, Beinhacker Law. We provide business and estate services to entrepreneurs, inventors, and other small business owners. Whether you're just getting started or you've been operating for a long time, contact us for all your general legal needs, from contracts to client agreements, from purchasing a new location to onboarding a new partner or key employee. We draft all types of agreements and handle most business transactions. For more information about our products and services, Visit BeinhackerLaw.com or you can follow our link in the show notes. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's interview. Hi, I'm Dorothy Kolb. I'm an outsourced CFO to small and mid-sized enterprises in the creative, social impact, and media production spaces. And I own and operate DK East Associates. All right, Dorothy. So thanks so much for coming on The Accidental Entrepreneur. I told you that I love when I meet new people through Aaron. Um, it was funny because I, I just kind of reached out to Aaron. I found her on LinkedIn. And then it turned out she's not only living in New Jersey and running the upside, but she's also like her husband, I guess, is a cousin of like one of my best friends. Oh, so wow. <laughs> it just, but we never met. So it's pretty funny. So small world. And you said you love the upside in terms of a, a consultant community, right? I do love the upside. I've been a member since um, beginning of Q2 of this year. And it was it has been probably the best thing I've done for myself or my business, just as far as um, resources and community and ways that Aaron has worked with me and how I present myself as a consultant. I have a marketing consultant for all things, you know, regular marketing, but to give myself that confidence, um, the way just I've tweaked how I present myself and my company has just, you know, increased my confidence and my business, to be honest with you. I've gone into um, negotiations with new clients that I'm just like much more firm about it because I 
have Aaron Halper in the back of my head saying, this is what you're going to ask for, which is so great. a different mindset, you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So if there's any consultants out there, they're looking to up their game and improve what they're doing. Check out the upside. I think it's be the upside.com is her, is her okay. website, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. But this today's about you and about all the knowledge and resources and expertise that you bring to entrepreneurs and small businesses and founders and, and so forth. But Dorothy, maybe we can go back to, you know, like where you're from, where you grew up, your schooling, and then because you proceeded through corporate America a little bit and then eventually got into your own consultancy, right? That is correct. All right. Um, yeah, you want to go way, way back? Um, yeah, I well, actually, you know. <laughs> I'm actually a Long Island girl, right. uh, born and raised. And um, I went to LIU Post. Oh, very good. Day. Yep, I think sure. it was still called CW Post. That's right. It probably it was. was. <laughs> I drove by it recently. I'm like, LIU Post. I think it was CW Post. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then I, you know, I started my career at Deloitte in New York City. Um, and then from there went into um, entertainment. I, I was at CBS Sports, Fox Sports, um, HGTV and Food Network. I did some time. That makes it sound like it's prison time, but I did some time at a local. Well, it doesn't feel that way. Right? No, it didn't. Local okay. TV station, KSBY TV in Central Coast of California. Um, and what did and you do there? It was at all. Well, here's Admin the interesting operations and stuff. Well, or? here's the interesting thing. When I yeah. left Deloitte, I went into CBS Sports and I was um, it's like an assistant production manager, um, assistant business manager for the Olympic unit. And then when everybody migrated from CBS to Fox, when CBS lost all their sports and Fox okay. picked up NFL, um, I had a bunch of friends who, you know, colleagues, coworkers who were like, you still want to do the accounting thing? And I said, you know, know what? No, let me try production and operations. So I kind of took came completely out of accounting and finance. Because that's what you did at Deloitte, accounting and finance? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. Um, and went into production. I was the manager of production and programming and did operations and all that. And it was so much more fun to spend the money than to account for it. But yeah. <laughs> um, I got married and moved up to the central coast of California. And of course, there's no major networks there. So I worked for KSBY TV and they were looking for um, a business manager and HR director. And I kind of, okay, I've got the CPA background. I've got all this television background. Let me combine it. And I was there for uh, a little over six years. And that was a great job. Fantastic job. I worked with two amazing general managers. And, um, and then CBS called me and asked me to come back to Washington, D.C. to work in radio for a couple of years. So that's what brought me back to the East Coast. Oh, OK. So you did kind of fall from Deloitte into TV and then but the skill set kind of followed you. It did. It did. And it was really cool to combine both because most accountants, CPAs, whatever, only have done finance and accounting. So they right. come at it from that perspective and they don't think of what are the implications if I recommend that we cut here, here and here. Right. Whereas I have been on the other side of it where I'm like, OK, I know what's going to happen if we make these adjustments. I think that's a shortcoming of a lot of CFOs, people, especially smaller businesses. Right. They hire somebody who they can can be their CFO. And they look at them as really a controller, the person that does the accounting, the bookkeeping and the finances. And they don't that's the smallest part of the job. But the impact on all the other departments is so um, significant to the success of the business. It is. And you have to have a, a uh, you have to have a CFO that understands that and comes. I mean, there are certainly a, enough of them, especially in the small business, small to midsize world that don't. They right. are, you know, full on accountants the whole way. And they have they haven't done this other stuff to see, you know, to know how it's going to impact this, how decisions are going to impact down the line. Yeah, there there was a um, a gentleman I interviewed out of London who is a not a CFO, but he's a business consultant, you know, type of guy. And he, he they did a study, I think, through the chambers of commerce in London, in England, not just London. And they found that a lot of these businesses, one of the reasons why they've run into difficulty is that the departments or the different divisions end up kind of as the company grows separating and not communicating. So finance and accounting is not, you know, dealing with HR and not recognizing what their decisions, how it impacts HR or how it impacts bit sales or technology and technology is not doing the things that the employees need. And 
it ne- leads to a lot of a lot of problems. But it's definitely a learned you know skill. And at the higher levels, you're probably hiring somebody for more money who's got a broader range of skills. At the lower levels, you're not, right? Right. You know, there's a really I don't want to plug another uh, someone else's book, but there's a really good book called Great Game of Business by Jack Stack. Okay. And in it it kind of addresses these siloed departments because it's all about having a, the great game where everybody's part of it and everybody, everyone from like, you know, the receptionist accounting, HR, you know, people on the, on the floor in the factory, whatever, have a piece of, of like bonusing based on the bottom line. And so everyone is involved. Everyone cares what everybody else is doing because if they miss a mark or whatever, everybody's bonus is, is affected rather than, well, we don't yeah. care what they did. They all have you skin know. in the game, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Well, I think that's one of the advantages of using someone, whether it's a lawyer or, or, a, or, a, or a finance person as a, as a fractional CFO, because you're working for multiple businesses. You see a lot of things that go on. I work with hundreds of businesses and I, I see things that, you know, the average in-house counsel is just dealing with their business on a daily basis doesn't see, not to mention the fact that smaller business can't afford you full-time or me full-time. So, right. you know, you can't get that expertise, but okay. So you went, so now you're in Washington and you were never on the radio, right? This is, this is a new one being on the podcasting world. <laughs> oh, not, right, not quite. I actually did a lot of uh, voiceover work um, for commercials. Oh, yeah. I did. I did a few teases for Fox NFL um, for CBS back in the day. And yeah, commercial time and uh, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah, but your main job was management and all that stuff. Okay, very good. Okay, and then, so how, tell me about the process about how you jumped ship and said, oh, I'm going out in the scary world of being alone. Yeah, it's a scary world of being alone. Yeah, it is. Well, my last CFO job was for a company that was 100% virtual. So I've been working remote since 2013. So oh, the perfect. whole, you know, when the pandemic hit, I was like, all right, so everybody no else blip. is home too. Right. Exactly. Um, the hardest part was helping everybody else through that. Um, but what they started to downsize um, back in like 2017. And I was, and this is my, my sob personal story. Um, I was newly divorced. I have four kids. I don't get alimony or child support. So I was at a, you know, it was more out of desperation than anything. And at that time, you know, my kids were younger and the thought of driving back into DC or down to Baltimore, you know, whatever to, um, you know, be gone from seven o'clock in the morning until seven, eight at night, it was not going to work. Right. It just wasn't. Right. And And so, you know, right. Exactly. And so, you know, I necessity is the mother of invention, right? Yeah, so it I, never comes I, at the right time, but yeah. No, exactly. But it was great. So I just, it, quite frankly, I took a couple of bookkeeping jobs early on just to get money in the door. And then I was like, wait a minute, I don't need to be doing these like total debits and credits. And these businesses out there are looking for someone like me. Yeah. And it had never occurred to me. I am like, I am exactly your accidental entrepreneur. I have no intention of being an entrepreneur. I don't come from a long line of entrepreneurs where I saw it being modeled my whole life where I'm like, Oh yeah, this is great. I'm going to fall right into it. No, they pushed you out the door and you're like, what? Out in the the woods. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like, well, yeah. And so I, uh, I, it, it just started to take on momentum and, you know, I found, then this is the interesting thing that having come from entertainment where there were so few women at the top, and yeah. so little room for women at the top that women were not supportive of each other. And so when I first started working on my own, I thought I probably don't want to work with women founders because they're going to just be that same kind of caddy kind of attitude. And what I found was it's completely opposite. They're right. so collaborative, so supportive that I was like, OK, this is great. This is you know totally going to work. And I'm going to work with women founders. And they valued me. I enjoyed working with them and valued them and it just kind of took off from there. And yeah, I've been I, very lucky with that. Well, I think in the corporate world that you came from, uh, you know, with, with the difficulty of in advancing as a woman, you're like paranoid that somebody else is going to climb over your shoulders, but in the, out in the real world, it's, you know, it's givers gain. Everybody's helping each other and, and, it, you know, abundance is a valuable thing in the, 
in the real world, but in the corporate world where people are looking to stab you in the back. I mean, it's not, it's in like that in all kinds of corporations. Everybody's worried about, you know, they, they, they trust that you're going to act in your own interest and take advantage of whatever you can take advantage of, which is totally understandable. But if there's very few opportunities, then you get more paranoid and stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so it's always a good question, right? You go out, it's not like you left an accounting firm or a law firm and you brought a large client base with you, right? Right. To, to get started, right? You're, you're in this position. And, and frankly, I, I applaud you for being so transparent. I don't know if I could put my whole life out there, but you do have it even in your bio that you got, you know, with your divorce and everything, but a little bit of that's cathartic and therapeutic, I think also. So, um, right. So, but here you are, right. So you have four kids, they're younger, I guess this is four or five years ago and you, you didn't have a client base. So, so like, where, where do you start? I mean, I could see myself, I'm coming out. I get attorneys all the time. They're like, do you have a job? I'm like, no, I, I don't have a job. Do you have business? No, like they don't have customers. So what do you do? Day one. Day one, I got on Upwork okay. and found a couple of bookkeeping jobs. I went on LinkedIn and looked for part-time controller type jobs, which I still have one of those clients to this day as well. Um, and what was interesting there was I I was surprised that, if for this particular part-time controller job, they were surprised that I was coming to them with my skill set because they would have thought that I would want a full-time job. Right. And since I was looking for a part, they were having a hard time finding someone with the skill set they wanted who only wanted to be part-time. So right. it kind of was, it was a great match that way. Um, and then from that point, it was those two clients saying, Hey, I work with this wonderful woman, Dorothy to their network. You know, if you, you know, if you need somebody or they would come, their network would come to them and say, you know, hey, do you know anyone? Sure. I have, you know, Dorothy over here. Right. So um, the, the tricky part was having them still understand that I was as dedicated to their business while I was building mine. Because right. there's always that thing where they think, OK, if I if I recommend her, then she's going to have less time for us. So yeah, it's it, the babysitter anomaly. Like if you tell people about your babysitter, you're going to lose her or him. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, I think they, you know, most companies look at, well, they're looking for a part-time CFO, let's say, but they think part-time means your other time is spent like taking care of your kids or not working for someone else, you know? Right. They don't right. look at it that way. But yeah, I mean, then you get to the point where you have 20 or 30 or how many clients you have now and people start to say, you know, how, how, you know, watered down or diluted can you get and still be able to I mean, then you build an infrastructure, I guess, right? Correct. So. Right. So now, now I don't. I only have. I have a limited number of clients that I work on that strategic level. I have another little stack of clients who we do like you know basic bookkeeping and kind of that stuff for. And I've got contract accountants that work on that, so I don't have to be in there doing that kind of work. And it right. frees me up to do actually the work that I enjoy doing better, and you know makes me obviously more available for those clients who are paying more. For right. Me. Yeah, well, I, I think a lot of, uh, I don't know, I guess you use the word consultants for the lack of a better term, but a lot of professionals, right? I think that's what they they miss. Like, they, you know, you need to build a business that is not only profitable, but doesn't drive you into the ground, you know, physically, because, you know, you only have so much mental capacity. You need a break. You can't do everything yourself. If you put yourself in a position where everybody needs you and wants you and they're hiring Dorothy, I mean, I'm in the same boat. You know, I don't want people to think that they need to talk to me every single freaking time because it's just it, it's exhausting. But I find a lot of professionals don't like they don't even write a business plan about they're like, well, I had an attorney once asked me we were doing a business plan challenge, like, you know, a week where you'd write your business plan. And uh, they're like, well, do I, should I participate in this? I mean, I don't what, what do I need a business plan for? I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to do all this stuff yourself for the rest of your life and don't even know whether it's profitable or not? I don't remember if he actually did it or not. But um, I think a lot of professionals in our world, you know, the, they miss that. Don't you think? They do. They do. I mean, any. I, I, I'll be completely honest. I even got swept up into that thinking that I had to be the one that did everything. And I think that and tacked on to that is the response time that I put on myself 
where because when you're in the corporate world, if your boss emails you or calls you, you're expected to jump and go, right? Mm-hmm. And you go into that with clients feeling the same way. And I think at first, you know, of course your clients are thrilled because they're like, oh great. Every time I, you know, email, two minutes later I get an email back. And I had a, a, a one of my clients tell me, your response time causes me concern for your work-life balance. Really? <laughs> I was like, wow. Okay. And I realized, and I kind of unofficially polled all of them, you know, on what are your expectations for this? Yeah. And they don't expect me to, of course, respond, you know, where it says, okay, you know, it was sent at zero minutes ago or whatever. Um, you know, 24 hours, if it's urgent, they have other ways right. to get in touch with yeah, me. Yeah, because you're not a full-time employee. Right. Yeah. But, so that's a, that's a kind of a click in my head that I had to make work to realize I am not because you coming from the corporate world, you still have that, you know, kind of feeling that that's the way you should be responding to every boss you have, which is every client you have in your head, right? Until you make that break from that, that thought process. I think you're right. I think a lot of it's in your head. I mean, maybe some of it's managing client expectations, right. but they're, I think they're more on the expectation level than you think they are, right? Because they know that you're, there's a reason that they don't have you on payroll and that they're not incurring the cost of a full-time employee. They want to make sure you're staying in business and being shared with other people. Because if you don't, you're going to be like, listen, I can't take care of you anymore because I got to go get a job. You know, that's right. not going to not gonna help them. But I, I do know some, I don't remember my friend, uh, I don't remember who I was talking to, a CPA or an attorney. I think it was an attorney where he said, you know, I can almost not, I can't even go on vacation. I'm like, why? Oh my God. Because my clients need things. They call me, they need it right away. They're doing a contract. They have a deal going on. I'm like, how could that be possible? Because, you know, what I do is so technical and I can't train an associate to do it because it takes time to, I'm like, you have to do that because you're going to burn out. You're going to, you know, and it doesn't serve the needs of your clients even. Absolutely. And I, I have to remind myself, what, which I did when I was managing other accounting staff, we're not saving lives. Right. Everything we do Good is fixable. Point. Right. No yeah. one's going to die if you make a no, goof and if up, you, you know? Yeah. And if you if you did something wrong, like you just could backtrack my error. Here you go. Here's the right one. And, right. and okay, so maybe there's, you know, ruffled feathers a little bit, but, you know, we're well, not saving lives. People expect you to be lives. human. Yeah. You know, for the most part, look, if the ones that really don't, you probably don't want to do business with them anyway. So, you know, that's one of the great things about being on your own is that you can choose who you do business with. A lot of people maybe not feel that way. They got to take everything. But yeah, it's nice when you get to that point when you don't have to anymore. Yeah, some things are profitable for your business. Some some things aren't. Look, there's plenty of things that I get introduced to that as from a skill set standpoint and a resources standpoint, I'm a small business owner. I don't do a hundred million dollar deal, you know. Because I don't have the resources, the bandwidth to support that and shut down my entire practice while I help them, you know, merge their companies at that at that level. And there's 26 attorneys involved. I can farm it out to somebody. I can maybe do part of it, but I'm not going to be the lead, you know, because it's just not what I do. I'm a virtual almost solo attorney. You know, that's why the practice that I've built. So. All right. So this is an advice podcast, right? So mm-hmm. we give advice to people. I don't like to use the word advice. We discuss things that maybe people can learn from, right? We want to be safe for you and me. Um, but you do put in, you know, your bio and the stuff you put out there that you drive a lot of growth in companies and things like that. So teach me all the magic. I want to know, you know, stories and what you've helped companies do and what a business owner should magic. think about. Yeah, <laughs> all, not all the magic. People got to call you too. Let's not give it all away, but you know, uh, some flavor of what people should be thinking about and the problems they run into and all that. That's a loaded question. I apologize. Yeah. (laughs) The biggest, the biggest thing, because I work with a lot of creative agencies, social impact firms, right? And even, even the the podcast production companies that I work with, we're, we're usually talking about creatives who are not finance. Right. The right brain. Finance savvy. I wouldn't say they're finance savvy, but they're just like, they just don't live in finance averse. They're like averse (laughs) to finance. They're really a lot of entrepreneurs are right brain. And we like the creative stuff and we like making our products and doing our stuff. And then we don't pay any attention to our numbers. At all. Exactly. And it's yeah. like, oh, there's money in the bank. So yeah, I must, it be, must okay. be good. Yeah, right? yeah fine. Right? Yeah. So one of the first things that I usually tackle with them is have you and I even have a, a like a webinar, a short webinar that I have called Carving Out Profits, where can we put like a link in the show notes? So people can see it. Sure. Is it available? It's out there. 
Yeah, it okay. is actually. We'll put a link and in the show a, notes. There's a little, um, there's a little, I call it a sale, a, a, a navigator too, for, for figuring stuff out, but. Okay. I'm going to make a note here. Okay. It, um, it's, uh, it's basically, I mean, and there's a, there's a, and I'm sure you've heard of it, of, of Profit First, which is a yeah, much I love, more. I love Mike Michalowicz has been on yep. my show. Yep. He's so great. So it's, 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 it's a kind of a watered down version of that because what I found, and I did go through that whole thing. I, I kind of use it to run stuff. my practice too, in a right. certain sense. Yeah. In a certain sense. Right. Yeah, because I when I was thing. going through it, it was, you know, the five different accounts and things like that. And, and that I, I found got a little too technical for some yeah. of my clients. Too, too so, many accounts, too complicated. Right. Right. So it's the pared down version of it is just flipping the formula of the one we learn is sales minus expenses equals profits. Right. It's sales minus profits equals expenses. And it's just this little tweak, but it, what it puts in your head is I've got to say I make $10,000 a month. Right. I want in my my pocket $2,000. Right, what you keep. Month. What I keep. So <laughs> right. that means I only have eight to work with. Right. And it's getting the, them in the, in the mindset of I'm not going to back into this profit number. I'm going to say that's what that's done. That's a that's a that's a like a hardwired number. So I only have eight thousand dollars to work with. Right. You'd be amazed at how much that just oh that it works. Little, it, it worked. You right? work within those numbers. If you had more, you'd spend it all. Look, taxes exactly. are the same thing. Tax Small business owners thing. get in trouble not paying taxes, and they live within their means. And they're like, "What do you mean I owe fifty thousand dollars in taxes?" Well, of course you you made money, so. You need it. To, I basically have a tax account, uh, an operating account, and a profit first account. You know, and I, abs- I have the exact same thing. I yeah, and if you don't put thing. it aside, I tell people, this, especially if they're young, starting out in business uh, on your own, if you don't put aside, let's say just to be safe, twenty percent, you probably get away with fifteen, but twenty percent in your tax account. I even pay it monthly. I don't even pay quarterly anymore, and because all electronic, I don't have to mail anything. So yeah, right. And and you put the and then every quarter I have some money in my profit account. I usually go away with my wife or do something with it. And sometimes I don't. Sometimes I pay some bills. I'll be honest with you. But um, you know, it, it like you said, it it might not even make the most economic sense financially from a cash flow, you know, money opportunity cost type of thing. But human nature is is that if we don't put these things into different buckets, we will spend what's in the bank account on Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And then I, I, I push that one more, one more over um, because I work with these creative companies, they get, you know, a contract with XYZ company and it's, you know, here's your $500,000 contract. And they're like, Ooh, yeah, we're going to spend $500,000. And it's like, no, let's put your pricing template together. Let's, at the very top, we'll take a hundred thousand dollars off that as your profit. Now you only got four hundred to work with, right. but then out of that, we're going to take out how much you're going to use to continue operating your company, to figure out how much you're going to spend just on this project. And does that make sense? So yeah. not only is it the profit, but it's like okay, yeah, we need to we need you know to pay administrative costs, rent, right. all that this, kind of stuff. Yeah, the difference between cost of goods sold. Correct. And actual expenses of running the business, which is the big one that business owners miss. They, they miss. Yeah. 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 And it's amazing once they are, you know, they're like, oh my God. And then then they kind of like get hyper focused on it. And it, it's kind of fun after that point because they're like, well, we did this this budget for this particular project. Did you take out, you know, that we're gonna do have, you know, postage or whatever? <laughs> like, right. okay. Yeah, but it's great because they realize, you know, oh, I really have control over this, and they can make the the ju- the call. Does this, you know, even if even if it looks like a ton of money, but if it's going to cost you five hundred five thousand dollars to do this five hundred thousand dollar project, then don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah, and you could easily hard, lose but, a job. Look, a lot yeah. of jobs get underpriced, right? And companies yeah. find themselves in trouble. Manufacturing, I mean, all kinds of different industries, even creatives, and doing, you know, getting a contract. Because they're just it's competitive bidding almost, you know. And then you're like, I mean, this happens all the time in the in the construction business. You get that's why they have bonds. Companies right. say you got to get bonded because they're underpricing the job, and then they end up, you know, losing money. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think during the pandemic, I, I always say cash flow hides a lot of things, right? So you like you said, money's in the bank. It's coming in. It's going out. It never really crosses. You're not making money, but your cash flow is keeping you afloat. Well, when the pandemic hit and the cash flow stopped, people started to realize that 
holy shit, I don't make any money with this business. Like, what, what am I been killing myself running this restaurant for 20 years? And they started rethinking things, you know? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah that, I think the pandemic made everybody look at the, the debits to their bank account, you know, the things going out the door a lot more closely because all of a sudden, yeah, they realized there was, yeah, I think you're totally right that, that you know, there's always $20,000 in my bank account. Great. Yeah. So, but that just means you're not building that every month. Right. Well, that should be a sign of something, right? If the if the balance is basically staying the same, you're not Absolutely. building anything. Yes. Yeah. You're not building anything. Yeah. Well, I, you know, that's kind of like the direct relation to how healthy our economy is, right? How fast dollars change hands. So if I think my cash flow is going down, I'm going to pay my bills slower because I'm nervous about emergencies that come up, you know, my kids need, my daughter needs her wisdom teeth out next month, whatever it is. And I'm like, you know, maybe I should hold on my money for a little bit longer, just in case, because you don't know what's going to happen. And that's what happens when the economy slowed down, which I guess is what they tried to do with the pandemic, which was let's keep money out there, which is a whole nother economic discussion as to whether yes, that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think maybe one piece that's missing with some businesses, and this is not true for all of them, is that maybe they should have an account, maybe it's 5% or whatever, where they put money aside for capital reinvestment and into their business, whether that's you know actual physical equipment or marketing or a new campaign or a new division or a new product development. Because I think- Or even that, a new you know, hire. Yeah, you know, good there, point. There's so many times that that I'll have clients say, you know, we're thinking of getting a biz dev person. How are we going to know if we're, you know, if that's going to work or whatever? And I'm like, okay, try to have, try. You can to put have, the money aside for six months, yeah, right? Yeah, three to six months. And that yeah. way, if that person doesn't work, at least you've only gone through that money that you put aside for it. And you're not in the hole for, you know, their salary you know, because they didn't bring in the, the you know, revenue that they thought. Yeah, they plus, you know, you can afford it, right? Here's a word from our sponsors. Uplift your marketing and reinforce your brand with a digital business card from Digital Accelerant. Use a text marketing combination to stand out in front of your competition. Digital business cards make you memorable and most of all help you bring in new business through its warm lead generator. Motion graphics, intro, outro, and inspirational videos can be added during setup. Text the word LAW to 21000. That's L-A-W to 21000 to learn how to get your own digital business card. Suffering from slow internet speed? Worried about hackers? Fetch Pro gets the internet from your smartphone to your Windows and Mac computer without paying for a hotspot. Always get the fastest, most stable, and secure internet access on your computer with Fetch Pro. Follow their affiliate link on our website to learn more and get connected with Fetch. Printify is the online service that simplifies and automates the process of sourcing and creating print-on-demand products branded with your company logo, product, or service. Printify is a better alternative to pre-purchasing and warehousing your merchandise for distribution or sale. Follow their link from our website to learn how to set up your own online store. And be sure to visit our online store and get yourself some podcast merch. Follow the link in the show notes to learn more about all of our sponsors. And now back to our show. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm listening. You're teaching me. So that's we went my, through profit that's, first. That's a good one. That's my big one. That's my really big one. Um, yeah. And then. Um, yeah. So really the biggest one you're saying is poor money management on the. Poor money management. I, there's a, there's side. a, there's a, uh, a stat out there that 82% of businesses fail, small businesses fail because of cash flow. Oh, I'm surprised it's that low. Yeah. So you would tell me it's 92%. Yeah, it's huge. And and the problem is just what you say is that they it can be you might be able to, you know, make the business work, but they're not paying attention to any of the numbers. So the they're not making any decisions with their cash flow. It's just all haphazard. There's no it basis is. for the decisions they make. It, it 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 reminds me of when I personally, you know, I, and probably a lot of people are like this when you're like younger and you've got, you know, your paycheck hits and you're like, woohoo, for, you know, a minute and then you got to pay rent. And there, you're always got this really small balance in your account. So you never want to look at your account because it's too depressing to look at it. Yeah. I feel like a lot of small businesses get in that space too, where they're like, if I don't, if I don't look at it, 
then, it, you know, as long as the checks don't bounce, but they don't, they're not actively involved in it. And it, it's intimidating. It definitely is intimidating. And I think a lot of people also rely heavily on their bookkeeper or their accountant to tell them when this stuff is happening. And, you know, of course, bookkeepers are in the present or past even, but in the present, they're like, they're just doing what's coming. Yeah. They're doing the calculations, categorizing everything. Yeah, exactly. And and your CPA, in fact, I just did a blog post on this. That's your bookkeeper, right? Your CPA is looking at your taxes. They're just, they're just figuring out what your estimates are and, you know, trying to mitigate your liability, but they're not looking at your growth. And that's where the CFOs come in or the outsourced or fractionals. They're the ones that are like, okay, here's your plan. How or here? Here's where you want to go. How are you going to get there? Here's what you're going to have to do. Right. And the hard part is that of that often is that the the business won't want to do what the CFO has said because it's uncomfortable. And you know, yeah, here are things you're going to have to do. Here's something you might not be able to do. You can't do that right now, but I want to. But okay, here's what's going to happen. Here's your your hockey stick of revenue or cash or whatever is now going the other way because you're not there yet. But maybe you can do it if you do a couple of things first, right? right? And position yourself. I think all business owners should get, a lot of them probably don't even have a business plan, but if they do, they should get back, do the financial plan, both what's been happening actually and what they would like to happen. And then, you know, start to figure out can can they do look some businesses whatever they're doing if they just pivoted a little bit or they changed their product mix or they offered a different service or they changed their pricing model they would be fine i'm not going to be rich but they'll be better off and they'll get through whatever it is and sometimes i mean look professionals in the legal space are totally um guilty of this all the time is they they underprice their services all of the time i can't you know i can't really ask my 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 cut my friends right so they know everybody that's who you're dealing doing business with I'm sure your right. clients are your friends too I mean I can't ask them to pay more than that for my services I said yeah but you haven't raised your fees you said in 15 years your doctor's raised what he charges your CPA's definitely raised his but what wow well, I feel I feel bad I said well do you feel worse shortchanging your family than, than your oh I didn't think about that I talked to a colleague of mine and, and she was like. And she went out the next day, raised all of her prices. Yeah, you know the, the other side of that too is is you know revenue is only revenue when it comes in the door, right? When it's cash in the door. And since I do with, deal with services companies, they'll bill or invoice, you know, send out invoices, and then I look at their AR and they have hundreds of thousands of dollars in their accounts receivable. I'm like, you know, you're running someone else's business when you do that. They have your services. Right. They've used and they're holding on to their your, their money. And you're so basically it's a bank of, at that point. You're no basically interest. a bank. And if you I, I, and it's interesting how many times I've said that and then the business owner will go, oh, it's like, yeah, you're not being mean by reaching out and saying, hey, your bill is past due. But right. they feel like that's somehow invasive or rude or something like that to remind someone that they owe you money. And I'm like, you know, if you I'm looking at your accounts payable and you pay everything on time. <laughs> Yeah. So that means you're not doing that to someone else or your bank for for your clients, you know. And right. Yeah. That, and I think people expect you as a professional to look to get paid. Like, why, if your service is as valuable as your clients think they are, right? Why would you not want to get paid? There's something. There's some disconnect there, right? I mean, look, I remind my clients usually twice a month if their bill's going up during the month and they owe from last month, middle of the month, I send them out another bill and I say, "Listen, just want to remind you, your bill's going up and you have a bill from last month, so please get caught up because I don't want to fall behind on people. What I got to go deal with collections and stuff? That's like the worst." Oh yeah, definitely, definitely, and uh, yeah, so. I think people, like you said, I think if they have a big receivables account, they feel like that's money in the bank. Like, oh, look, I have a half million dollars receivable. We have a half a million dollars of receivables. But the older it gets, the less collectible it is. Companies go out of business. They get in trouble. Even well-intended companies, they're not looking to screw you. But they got someone else chasing them for money. So, yeah, that's it. A lot of them will be, you know, they're not going to ask for it. You know, your Well, that's the thing, right? You deal with the fire. You deal with yeah. the people that are coming. Listen, I have to send this out to collections. I don't know what else to do. You're like, okay, no problem. I'll pay you. And then they don't pay the other person because right. they didn't ask. Right. And that's life. I mean, that's just the, you know, the reality of things. So yeah, you could definitely have to get comfortable with those kinds of, just like I say, people listen, you got to do everything in writing. 
I don't know if I could be with a client, whip out an agreement. Like it's so professional, you know, formal. I go, yeah, it's professionals. That's what professionals do. They put things in writing because you, Dorothy, and me, Mitch, don't remember what we talked about a month and a half ago when we set up our arrangement. Could you imagine you doing fractional work for people? I assume you have a contract, right? With Absolutely. all the stuff. Of course. So how could you remember every deal you have with every customer? But oh, I'm not really comfortable with that. I said, well, if you're going to be a professional, this isn't like a game for you. You really want to make money doing it. You got to figure a way to become comfortable with asking people to pay, asking people to sign agreements, holding them to what your agreement is, because you know, you're flexible with people and you make accommodations for them. They got to do the same thing for you. But I think you're right. I think people are, they're like afraid. They are. They are. Yeah. I mean, there's so many, so much uncomfortableness around money and yeah. it, it shouldn't be. I think you're right that, you know, other, if other businesses that you're dealing with, if, if you're not asking for these things, I think somewhere in the back of their head too, they're starting to think, huh, how, how legit or how professional is this person? If they're, they're not papering this, they're not asking me to pay them, right. you know? And, and I think in those relationships, it might go on for, you know, probably longer than it should, but at some point your the client or the customer will be like, yeah, I want to deal with somebody who's a little more on the ball. You know, yeah, if, it's a reflection of is, your other parts yeah, of your business, right? If my stuff is falling through the cracks. If this part of it is falling through the cracks, what else is that I'm not even thinking about that this person is not addressing because they're, you know, not 100% there or whatever scenario they come up with in, in their head for that? So, yeah, and, and I think there are good ways and comfortable ways to address those issues with clients. You don't have to sound like you're either begging for money or being threatening or aggressive, there's ways to be nice about it. You know, you could, you could reach out to your client and give them an update on something and such and such and such as we're going to do this, this, and this just want to give you an update. Oh, and I want to remind you that your bill this month is still outstanding. If you can make arrangements, I would very much appreciate it. Here's a link to our payment account or whatever. I don't know, however you do it, you know, and, and just, you know, a little bit of a nudge. There's definitely ways to become, you know, more comfortable with it. So, so what other like mistakes and common problems. Let's put money aside now that everybody's uncomfortable um, <laughs> that people make that you see with the business owners are struggling with. Um, you know, another part of it, I think is when they have, and I think everything circles, circles around money, but when they have, you know, we were just talking about papering relationships and stuff, but, you know, not doing that, I think is, is a big piece whether it's partners coming in and they're like, Oh, it's just my buddy. And he's going to come in and just, you know, we're going to go 50, 50 and, and nothing's done. And then down the road, it's, well, we said 50, 50, but then I did all this work that I wasn't right. compensated for. Yeah. And we did this that I, you know, put myself on that for or whatever. And now it's a very, I mean, you thought the how much money was in the bank is uncomfortable. The, how much do each of us own of this business is right. Or if it goes the other way, now you're starting to look for, you know, contribution in where we're running out of money. Now we both need to, I need to put in 50%. You need to, Oh, that wasn't my understanding of this arrangement. Right. Yeah. And then you know, they want the benefit without having the risk that goes along with it. So that that's been a big one that I've seen recently. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely a problem, but you're right. It comes down to money. I've seen a lot of times where they have employees that are a small business, they have a couple of employees, they start growing, they're adding several employees and then everyone ends up like in the wrong job. You know, like the person who was really your assistant is now the office manager. And they never, she doesn't really have the skill set for that. She's overwhelmed. She doesn't want to tell you. And then you have other people you bring on and they're not communicating. And it becomes, um, I'm not sure. I'm not a, I'm not an HR person. You're more of a management person. I don't know how you deal with that. Yeah. You know, I, I have one company that, that has a lot of staff in and out and all. And I think the, the one thing that, companies forget is, you know, it's way easier to get these structures in place when you're small than it is to backtrack when you've got 20, 30, 50 employees. And then you're like, oh, shoot. First of all, back to the money for a second. Now you got to have some HR consultant come in and write all this stuff for you Fix and figure everything. out how are you going to go retroactively right. on all these employees. So, you know, you pay me a dollar now or, you know, a thousand dollars down the road. That's what that comes to. But I think that earlier you get these these structures in place for from an HR perspective of you know the employee handbook, how are you going to onboard someone, right. how are you going to offboard someone, how are Big you going to handle complaints and job all that when you've got right? job descriptions, all that. Yeah. 
you know, reviews, if you're going to do reviews and that kind of thing, the earlier you have that done, the er easier it is to shuffle more people into that system. Yeah, so that's you have a system of, now. That's the problem. They system. don't have a system, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's one of the things that that I actually, you know, looking at it just from a system perspective, um, that's some, one of the things that I, you know, recommend early on, not just from HR, but even from, you know, accounts, accounts receivable and payables to have a system. How are you going to, you know, get invoices out? How are you going to send reminders? Who is going to send reminders? Who's going to stay on top of the AR? Like on the AP side, where are bills going? You know, I can't tell you how many companies I come into work with and it's, oh, well, somebody will email, like whoever the employee was that worked with that vendor will get the invoice and, you know, the bill in email to them. And then sometimes they remember to send it. Sometimes they don't. They don't know who to send it to. They'll send it to three different people. And now you're, you know, like 30 days down the road and some vendors calling, complaining that they haven't gotten paid when nobody knows where right. they have a bill for that. Yeah. So having that system in place of just, even if it's email and it's not like a bill.com or something like that, but exactly, you know, you're going to email it to accounting at, right. And make it a, make it a, an alias account that, if you know Stacy leaves, who was your yeah, accounting well, that's person? That's always a big problem, right? It, it doesn't go away, you know. And that's so make it an accounting at accounts payable at whatever, so that the next person in just takes over the history's there, you know. And then of course, you know things like like Bill dot com, where you could send it through the approval process, and all is always great too if you're, you know, able to do that kind of thing. But I think as a business owner, it also lowers your level of stress. Because if oh. not, you're trying to figure things out every time and you're just like starting over. Yeah. And, you know? and I just went through a, a situation where we had to reopen individual um, email accounts that had been archived because we're looking for stuff. Right. Who they're and not there anymore. Right. Right. They left like, you know, two years ago and you're oh. like, oh, my God, thank God we still had those accounts, you know. But yeah. otherwise, you know, if you have like a general where this stuff goes, you know, next person rolls in and it's all still there. So, yeah. um, yeah, having, yeah, I think that would be besides all the cash kind of forecasting stuff, the biggest one would be to have processes in place, structure in place way earlier than you think you need it. Yeah. Well, I think that's like the one quarter part of the business plan, right? The people side of your business. So you start to kind of sketch out what that looks like. And that does eventually become your handbook with job descriptions and all the procedures. And I mean, even for, you know, what time off they get and what benefits you want to have and, you know, how, how that looks, because I think it's, it's crazy. I had a client who had a, I guess he had a couple of staff, but somebody went on, on, I believe, maternity leave. So let's say you, Dorothy, took over her job and you, and you totally got overwhelmed. This person got totally overwhelmed with whatever was going on. So I remember, I think she left the company or whatever. And one day the boss gets a call, like about, like you said, about their job or about a bill or whatever. So they're looking around this woman's desk because it hadn't been filled yet. And the woman had the other woman hadn't come back. They open up, you know, the, the overhead things oh, yeah. on the, so they open it up. She had been stuffing all of the files that were coming through, like the jobs, I guess, cause she, I don't know. I, I don't know what happened. She had a panic. She's stuffing them in there. All the jobs, nothing had been done. Like the bills were stuffed in there and the files were stuffed in there and just closed it <laughs> left. And Yeah. And it was not good. I mean, they fixed it, but he, if the client, if a customer hadn't called and said, Hey, what's going on with my job? And he couldn't find the file. He would have never figured it out. Yeah. Yes. I'm a big proponent of uh, centralized information and not in a paper form. If, right. Or in addition to a paper form, having just electronic stuff somewhere that you can, you know, search and find and, because the stuff that is in people's drawers in a regular office is scary sometimes. Yeah, this was I, also years ago. We didn't really have cloud systems. Yeah, right. And, and I remember, you know, having managed a, a pretty large accounting staff, and that's exactly I can't tell you that would happen all the time. The yeah. person right, they they leave because they got overwhelmed, and they got overwhelmed because they didn't know what to do, and they kept shoving stuff, and they realized that in their overhead was this really scary mess, and they were like, "Okay, I'm just going to quit." And yeah. then it's not my problem anymore. I'm sure your days of Deloitte were not, there were no cloud systems, right? It was all oh God, file yeah. cabinets and folders and Pendaflex. And does that come to even in business anymore? <laughs> you know, Pendaflex. Yeah. That's what it was when I was in law firms when I was younger. Yeah. 
So, it was, I mean, we had file rooms. You did too, where, you wow. know, you'd roll the things. They would move so you yep. could get in there. It would take up like a lot of real estate with with these oh. firms because you had to keep files for a certain period of yeah, time. And you had to make friends with the people who were in the file room so that, you know, they could go get your stuff quicker. <laughs> I remember that too. Yeah, the whole filing system. Now you don't need that stuff. But I, I think for a small business owner, that's a good thing, right? Because you can now file and, and control a lot of data where before – it was difficult. You'd pick up file cabinets secondhand. You'd have them all over the office. You know, you never really, because you're always kind of, kind of bootstrapping whatever it is you're, you know, you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And in this whole pandemic thing, of course, you know, everybody moving virtual, um, having things on a, in an electronic format obviously was crucial. No, and big time. I don't, yeah. And I'm hoping that, you know, many don't go back to, just a paper format. Yeah, of why? Things. I mean, I worked for a client. I work for a client now who that was. I mean, we paid everything with you know everything was paper. It's a you know like they would state. mail checks and stuff. Mail checks. I mean, I was yeah. I'm their controller, and it was you know, mail checks and paper files of bank statements and bank reconciliations and all that stuff. And and I was trying to force the let's get to an electronic version. The pandemic did that for me. Like, I know that did that for me too. I got clients didn't want to deal with me on Zoom or whatever, and now they're forced to, and they're like fine with it. Even I don't know what your thought is, but even like my QuickBooks, I don't print out my reconciliations anymore. If I no. need them, I can get them. Right? I, what do I need to? What do I need to keep them for? I mean, maybe absolutely. Maybe yeah. trust accounting. I'm supposed to print them out, but I, I think they just need to be available. Oh yeah, well it's a different thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, but I don't. I think electronic format's fine. I don't think you have to keep paper file. You don't have to keep paper client files uh, that are, I have very few paper files anymore. I'm all in the cloud because I want to be able to work from wherever I am. I don't, you know, now that things have changed, I, yeah, there's a whole contingent of, well, your world is all fractional, but there's all contingent of like solo lawyers that have, you know, deliberately, as a matter of fact, I think the networking group is called like deliberate solos that have literally said, I want to be solo. I want to be light on my feet. I want to be virtual and I want to work from, you know, a beach in, in, you know, the keys and I'm a patent attorney. So it doesn't matter where I am. I could deal with clients in New Jersey. Like, you know, yeah, the whole movement. Yeah. it's great. I mean, I, I love being virtual because I can, I have clients in California. I have them in New York. I have them here in DC. You know, I've had one in the UK. I mean, so it's, you know, all your staff's virtual, right? Your contracted people, everything, correct. right. You don't need yeah. office space. No. Nope. Yeah. I'm in a co working space. I, by choice. I'm not going to work at home, but I don't have, I, I need people. I pull them in. I got virtual assistants, virtual, whatever, you know, when I need them, when I need them, but I think people can build a better infrastructure than they realize, right? Because yes. these services are out there. You don't have to go and hire people if you don't really need to. Right. I think the whole fractional environment um, is something that's not tapped into nearly enough. Like with the VAs, with people like me, even with a bookkeeper, you know, you don't have to have somebody full time, um, doing your work all the time. So, right. Well, I, I think, think that the, whole industry got a boost, right? With yeah, 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 for sure. Um, I think the other thing to, you know, like the advice that I would have, or or we're not offering advice, are we? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no guarantees. That's no all. guarantees. Right. Um, is the whole you know negotiating or navigating rather navigating the um the W two and ten ninety nine employee, which is you know. Oh yeah, something that we could have probably a whole other episode on this. But I um, have co- client discussions all the time oh. because I deal with the Department of Labor all the time for it, and people don't understand that just because somebody's part time for you, let's say, and they come in a couple of days a week, does not mean that they're a ten ninety nine employee. They may still have yeah. to be on payroll, even though they're working at three companies. Like that's not the test, right? Right. And you know. get it. yeah. And so I actually worked for a company, the last one I worked with that, um, that was a big issue. Um, and California was the first, you know, they were on it. I mean, I did HR out in California. If you can do HR in California, you can do HR anywhere. Isn't that where the is, whole Uber lawsuit came from? It was it yeah. in California where they're yep. like, they're not independent contractors. Yeah. Yep. Cause the department of labor's they're looking to protect the employees Yes. And they California get more protection. California is way more employee centric than yeah. any other state. Yeah. But, you know, they were hit with a big with a big um, penalty because they were calling all these employees or the contractors. workers contractors and they yeah. weren't, you know, so. Yeah. And there's different taxes and there's different reporting requirements and different, you know, you have to pay them more frequently. 
and all that kind of stuff. Look, if you're dealing with a VA, if you have a part-time assistant, she's working from home and she works for you and doesn't really have like a business, right? She's really a W-2 employee. Now, maybe yep. you're a small potatoes. Maybe the Department of Labor is not going to care. You're one person, whatever. You pay the self-employment tax, whatever. But if she, if he or she has a business and they have an LLC, for example, and they're doing virtual work for a lot of different companies, that's different because they're going to send different. you an invoice from the company, right? But yeah, I think people don't realize that just because they drive your trucks doesn't make them independent contractors. or Right. Or the intern issue, too. Oh, yeah. Now that we're in summer, you know, that the intern thing where, oh, I have an intern. Are they getting college credit? Well, no. Um, <laughs> you're going to need right. to pay that person. You know, you and definitely can run into some labor issues. Oh, my gosh. You'd be, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm always surprised at this. And it's like, well, we're going to pay them, you know, minimum wage minus. You right. Know, and volunteer. Ex- yeah. You can't take volunteers. Like, you're not a nonprofit. <laughs> you know. <laughs> this person's not a docent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But there are some industries, though, where it's common practice, um, uh, uh, the dance industry, like dance studios, because I deal with a bunch of them, where it's very common practice for them to all they pay all their dance instructors on a 1099. These dance instructors work all kinds of places. Right. Yoga common studios, practice. too. Right. Right. Yeah. But it is not correct. Even though it's common practice, it's still they should be on W. If they work for three different studios teaching classes, they should be getting a W-2 from each of them. It's what they do for a living. It's not some like you're an accountant, you have an accounting practice. It's different. They provide the services that the businesses use to make money with. They should be getting W-2s hourly, but W-2s, you know. Right, right. W-2 doesn't mean somebody's on salary. We know that it could be hourly. It doesn't have to be the same every week. But, yeah, that's definitely a big trap. It is a big trap. Yeah. Especially if you got a hundred contractors, then you're a target. Then you're yes. Or or someone who flips back and forth between 1099 and W2. That that is a flag too. You know, they're oh they're they're W2. Oh, then we then they became a 1099. And then, you know, at some other point they go back to W2 and 1099 right. and you're okay. Are there yeah. was there did their job change? The total that much? red flag. Yeah. yeah. I had a guy who was working for he was a marketing guy, but maybe he was working for medical practice or something. And they owed him money. I guess the practice had the doctor had financial trouble, right? But they owe him the money. So you can't just not pay people. That's a big DOL issue, right? So when we had to file for a hearing, all of a sudden he got a 1099. They they took back the W-2. They reissued it as a 1099 because you can't go to the DOL for a hearing. You have to go to court. It's more costly. They have you have less rights. As a 1099 uh, contractor. Right. So during the hearing, I don't do a lot of litigation. So I go down for this hearing. It was just a ridiculous show. Everybody's watching this thing's going on for hours. The guy who's the hearing officer wants to shoot himself over this whole thing. But at the end of the day, the CPA comes on because they were testifying about something that the CPA said. I said, you can't do that. You got to bring the CPA in to testify. Oh, yeah, he's over here. Must have been like 98 years old. Oh. He was in like disheveled clothes. So he comes up. And we, I realized while I'm talking to him that I had a 1099 for my client and a 1099 for the receptionist. And I'm like, so I said to them, him, you 1099, the receptionist, does she work like for mo- Is it like a service that, co-? no, no, she, I said, so basically you reissued it and you accidentally reissued her a 1099 too. And he, I got him to admit it. He oh, said, wow. yeah, yeah, you're right. That's what we did. So we won the whole thing and the guy had to pay and he paid, he had to pay legal fees and, and everything. But yeah, that's what they tried to do because we all know that if you're a, te- if you're really a contractor, you don't get the, you don't, you're not allowed to file with the DOL and get a right. hearing. You got to go to court. Yeah. That was a crazy thing. People try to be creative. I mean, there's, you know, there's creative accounting and then there's not breaking the law. <laughs> yes. Breaking the law. <laughs> Violating the rules. Yeah. And, the, and, and those penalties and, and they add up. They do. You know, they do. 500 and employee, if you have a hundred of them is 50 grand. So that's a lot for a small business owner to pay. Yes. Yeah. And, and hey, look, you usually can negotiate that stuff if you did it inadvertently, like, like you, you know, you pay your people well, you pay them on time. You do, you generally can negotiate a lot of that stuff away, but you know, if you're doing it to skirt the law, to pay them less, to, good luck. Yeah. Then you can't go to me. You got to go to a real employment attorney. Real. You need the ones that and charge you five or $600 an hour. Yeah. Okay. Have a nice life. Yeah. 
So, okay. So, cause I know we're running out of time. I, I want to, um, first of all, if people want to connect with you, learn about your services, um, where would they go? Your website? My website is DK East. So DK com. Okay. And we'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, I am also on Instagram. Okay. At DK East Asos. So, um, I'll what do you post on that. Instagram? Like, Cookies and cakes. I mean, what? What? Pictures of IRS forms and Pinterest. <laughs> oh, that's Pinterest, right? Right. Well, it's an Instagram like photos. I always think of Instagram. Yeah. I do. I it post is. on Instagram. I think I do. When I, you'll be posting on Instagram through this podcast. Yeah. But, no. Like, what would I, I do I, as a lawyer? Post right? a picture of a will. I don't know. Yeah, right. Right. I, I do. I do little like advice. I do. I you know link articles. I put my own podcast up there. Um, Very good. What's the name of your podcast, by the way? It's called Thriving in the Chaos. Thriving in the Chaos. And I assume it's on Apple, Google, it's on everywhere Amazon. you find it. I, it's brand new. So there's only three episodes so far. Okay. But um, yeah, it's basically, you know, kind of leaving corporate and going out on your own and, you know, half kind of personal journey, kind of here's some bits and pieces of advice along the way. Good. Well, maybe when you get to 100 episodes, you have me on as a. There you go. As a, as a returning guest or something like that. And then I know you have a LinkedIn profile, right? You're on LinkedIn too? I do. I'm on LinkedIn under my name, Dorothy Kolb. Okay. And um, that's it. That's those okay. are the ways to connect with me. Yes. Very good. Well, Dorothy Kolb, I thank you very much for joining me this morning, taking an hour out of your day. And um, let's stay in touch and watch as your podcast grows too. Yeah, great. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thanks, Dorothy. If you like the podcast, please tell others about us. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, on Google Podcasts, on Amazon Music, and many of the other podcast directories. If you like what you hear, please leave us a five-star review and feel free to share our episodes on social media. If you have any questions or comments, ideas for the show, or you'd even like to appear as a guest, reach out to us by email at info at beinhackerlaw.com. The Accidental Entrepreneur is hosted and produced by me, Mitch Beinhacker. If you'd like more information about my legal services, you can find me on social media or visit my website at beinhackerlaw.com. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe to our feed to be notified of all future episodes.